Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. I'm Diane Okonski, President of the Icelandic National League of the United States, and I'm very happy you're able to join us this evening for a special program. The INLUS is committed to providing programs, classes, and other offerings that create a connection point for Icelanders, people of Icelandic descent, and for those interested in Iceland. Information on the INLUS can be found on our website, on our social media sites, through our blog and our newsletter. Uh, if you are already a member of the INLUS, thank you. If you are not a member, I encourage you to join. Your membership helps fund scholarships, grants, local projects, and other offerings the INL, through the INLUS. Before we get started this evening, I do have just a couple of reminders. The program is being recorded and will be available on the INLUS website. Also, as an attendee to this program, you are on mute. However, we want to hear your questions and we welcome your questions. We will answer as many as possible through the course of the program. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you are on a tablet or a smartphone, that button may be either in the right hand corner uh, upper right hand corner, or it might be on a different page. You may need to swipe to find it, but don't let that stop you. We want to uh, we want to make sure we get your questions in. So let me introduce tonight's guest. Uh, Mr. David Frazee is a world renowned photographer. He has worked for 30 years as a freelance location photographer and as an educator. Uh, he now has retired and devotes his full attention to his fine arts photography which includes his projects and books. His work has been exhibited internationally and his photographs are in collections of many museums and corporate art collections. He has shared his photographic skills with others through teaching at several colleges and universities, including serving as an adjunct professor in film and media arts at Temple University in Philadelphia. Mr. Frazee is the photographer and author of four books, the first three, West Coast Bering to Baja and East Coast Arctic to Tropic, as well as Mississippi River, Headwaters and Heartland to Delta and Gulf, comprise his trilogy on North American waters in a time of rapid climate change. He describes his latest book, Iceland Wintertide, as a fitting coda to the trilogy. He states that ice has become the canary in the coal mine and a symbol of climate change on a warming planet. David, I am just so thrilled to have you with us tonight, and I will turn the program over to you. Well, thank you very much, Diane, and thank you, Doug, and thank you to the Icelandic National League of uh, the United States. Pleasure to present some work to you, and uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and share my screen at this point. So, okay, I think I've got, is everyone seeing just the three books? Yes, okay. All right, so this is what we're gonna start with. Um, I did, uh, I've done a total of four books. These first three books comprised what's known as the Trilogy of North American Waters. And I did not start out. The first book I did was West Coast uh, that you see on the left there, Bering to Baja. And I started that in the late nineties, actually. It took a long time to get a publisher. That's a whole nother story and all different presentation. But getting a book done is not easy of any kind. I had no idea I'd end up with three more after doing West Coast. In a nutshell, the three books, uh, climate change is certainly the underlying theme and, and human, humankind's relationship to nature is also an underlying theme. All right, so I'm gonna go fairly rapidly through the, the three books, but I did want to use them as a foundation. And again, feel free to use the, the Q&A box. I'll check it every so often to see if I'm getting any questions. Although actually I'm, I might not see it as well. But anyway, we'll worry, worry about that later. So this is the, the map of the West Coast of North America, also known as the good part of the Ring of Fire. And what makes this coastline so uh, dangerous actually is the fact if you can see in the gray area, that represents the Pacific plate of the tectonic plates. 
the brown and white is the North American plate. And those two plates are crashing against one another all around the rim of the Pacific Ocean. It's called the Pacific Rim for that reason. And so when I go out to photograph, let me get started here. So this is in the Aleutian Islands, uh, which was one of the most fascinating places I've ever been, just an extraordinary part of the world. But it's a volcanic ice uh, island chain. And in fact, one of the largest earthquakes, if not the largest recorded, took place in Anchorage, Alaska back in 1964. It was a 9.3 or 4. Uh, back then, it wasn't as populated, so there wasn't as much uh, death and destruction as there would be today. Um, so the other thing I wanted to point out is these are the Aleutian. This is my first view when I was flying out to the Aleutian Islands. It's always windy and cloudy and get, you're, you're lucky. I was out there over a week uh, just to hope that I would get a few days to photograph. And I was very fortunate that on the flight in, we dipped below these cloud covers and there were the islands lit up in the just beautiful light. Um, but this again is a volcanic island chain. Uh, this is a series of mountains near uh, Anchorage just west of Anchorage. And we have, I have a writer named Simon Winchester who wrote for these all three of these books. And he would say, uh, you know, what I'm really photographing is scenery, to put it plain and simple. Landscape photography, we're out photographing scenery. But what Simon wanted people to understand is when you're photographing beautiful scenery, he would always say where there is beauty, there is danger. Because all this incredible scenery. This is British Columbia, the coastal mountains, uh, the water down below that cloud is the Strait of Georgia, which is in between Vancouver Island and uh, the uh, British Columbia coast. And that's all a volcanic region too. Mount Garibaldi is one of the major volcanoes there. Uh, this is in Alaska. This is uh, the Mendenhall Glacier, which uh, I was out there, uh, back there in 2013. This photograph was taken in uh, 2004. And in the nine years since I had been out, it had retreated. It was about where I took this uh, photograph uh, originally. And then we went back and it was way back even, even farther. So you can see it firsthand, it's, it's melting, things are melting much more rapidly than any worst case scenarios have been predicted. Another example of volcanic origins, this is the uh, Crater Lake. I don't know if anybody's been there. It's a national park in Oregon, uh, about a hundred miles in from the coast. It was called uh, Mount Mazama. It was, it was originally a 12,000 foot tall volcano. It erupted and collapsed about 12,000 years ago. And over a 250 year period, rain and snow filled in the lake to a depth of 1,100 feet. Beautiful, beautiful, haunting place. And if any of you ever driven the Pacific Coast Highway, which is something I recommend everyone do at least once in their life. And when I say drive it, I mean, starting in Washington, state of Washington, and all the way down to San Diego if you have the time, it's just incredible. This is the Big Sur area of the, of, uh, the California coast. All right, so when I finished that book, I had no, people said, well, you're gonna do the East Coast. And I really said, well, I don't think so. I really, I don't know what the hook would be. The, there's the scenery is pretty flat and low and, I'm just not sure that I, I could make it interesting. Well, I no sooner said that than Hurricane Sandy came and hit the whole Northeast part of the United States, especially hard hit in New Jersey and New York City, Staten Island, Jersey Shore. Um, here in Philly, we were fortunate, even though we were in the, the path, uh, the coast kind of broke it up for us. But I then went, drove to the Jersey Shore to see the damage. And I thought, man, this is really something. Uh, 
I think I do want to photograph the East Coast no, now because it's going to become under threat with rising sea levels. And this was a perfect example of the damage caused by storm surges and already and seas that are getting higher. Next thing I had to do was define the East Coast. So here's a map and where I ended up photographing was if you look at the west coast of Greenland, uh, I, can you see my cursor? I don't think you can. Can you see a cursor in there or not? Probably not. You do? Okay. Then I was, uh, I started up here in the uh, west coast of Greenland and I was in this area then went over across the Davis Strait into uh, Cumberland Sound, which is right in here. This is the Arctic Circle right here. So it was right around the, above the Arctic Circle and below it. And then I photographed, this is an incredibly beautiful place. This is part of up, uh, Quebec up here and then Labrador. There's a national park in here, you'll see a photograph of it. That's, I didn't even know it existed. And it's as rugged scenery as you'll find anywhere, beautiful fjords. Then I came down to Newfoundland, which is gorgeous. Uh, the Gas Bay Peninsula right here to Nova Scotia. And then all the way down the coast of the United States out to the Florida Keys and Dry Tortugas, which is the last key. It's not Key West. A lot of people think it's Key West. There's one more you can take an airplane out called Dry Tortugas. There's a fort out there. So here the idea was, uh, this is in Greenland, and this is the Jakobshavn Ice Fjord, which you know, if you read anything about climate change and where the ice is pouring out of the Greenland ice sheet, it's at this area. And you can see the people here that are just dwarfed by this huge mountain of ice. 70% of the icebergs in the North Atlantic come from this glacier. In fact, the iceberg that sank the Titanic, there's a 70% chance it came from this fjord. Now, I've, been, I've seen photographs since I was there. I was there in 2013. And you know, I'm not seeing the large icebergs coming out anymore because the ice is, the melt is moving farther up into the harbor there or the, the mouth of the glacier. So a, a prime example of ice melt. And of course the polar bear has become a symbol of the warming planet, uh, ice breaking up. This, this uh, handsome lad had just jumped out of the, uh, up out of the water because they, they walk all along these ice flows. And the, what's happening is this ice is melting and they can't do this anymore. Many of them are starving. They, they go to swim. They'll swim. They're great swimmers, but they can't swim 40 miles. So people are very concerned that the polar bears are going to disappear in a couple of, gener well, I shouldn't say generations, but maybe 20 to 40 years. There's worry that they could go extinct. This is this uh, Torngat Mountain National Park, which I was uh, alluding to before, just extraordinarily beautiful, very difficult to get to. There's no, uh, well, there are some boats that go there, but not on a regular basis. You'd have to charter a boat or, and to get in there uh, on foot or by the air, you have to go in by seaplane, which is what I did. And this is uh, Newfoundland. What you're looking at in the back with the snow-capped mountains, that's actually one of the few places in the world, maybe the only place in the world, where that's the Earth's mantle that had come up from the center of the Earth and now it's uh, exposed. It's, it's all red and rust colored up there, and, but it's an extraordinarily beautiful place. You'll see I do a lot of, did a lot of aerial photography, especially for the East Coast Project, because you had to get up in the air to put the East Coast uh, cities into an environmental context, into a relationship with the sea. This is the uh, Bay of Fundy in um, uh, New Brunswick, Canada, where the have these extraordinary high tides. And you can see it's, it's high changes 30, 40 feet each day. 
And fortunately, I was there when the tide was out, so I could walk down and photograph these famous rocks that uh, you can see the erosion caused by the tide coming in and out. Here's what I'm talking about getting up in the air. Very important to get up in the air. This is the farthest uh, east, eastern point of Long Island. And the point that you see at the top of the screen to the right, that's Orient Point uh, on Long Island. And you can see, it's the, the point of this was, I didn't photograph any damage. That didn't interest me. I have one shot of damage coming up. But I just wanted to let the imagination do the work. If I can show you where the sea is in relationship to the land, it doesn't take much to go, wow, there's, there's not much uh, room for sea level rise there, is there? Look like two leaves floating in a leaves floating in a pond. This was the only damage I photographed, and this is kind of what started the project to begin with. This roller coaster that was tossed into the ocean uh, when Hurricane Sandy went through. This was photographed. That happened in uh, I think it was a, a September or October. I forget which month of. Uh, 2012, I photographed this in March, so almost six months later, it was still out there in the ocean, be became a bit of a tourist attraction, although they tried to keep people away, they, people would come in and they'd shoo them away. And New York City, of course, uh, of course, this is what took the brunt of Hurricane Sandy, where the hurricane, the surge came right into the harbor here to lower Manhattan, the battery, and flooded out all of lower Manhattan. To the right is Brooklyn. That got swamped uh, all the way out to the far Rockaways. Uh, Staten Island, which is below the Statue of Liberty, it's out of view here, would be below. That got swamped. Uh, just an absolute nightmare. And that was a, only, a, people forget, that was only a category one storm, Sandy. It's just that it was huge and it stalled. It covered, I think, almost all of the northern, uh, northeast America uh, of the United States and up into Canada. Here's another example. This is the Delaware River, not far from where I live in Philadelphia, as it heads out to the Atlantic Ocean to the Jersey Shore. You see that ship down below, and just to the right of the ship, there's a canal opening. That's the Chesapeake um, Delaware River Canal that connects the two bodies of water. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I learned a lot by doing these uh, this project, all these projects. And that's the Salem nuclear power plant in the back there. So all these nuclear power plants are built near water for cooling purposes. And as we saw, in Japan and uh, Fuji, Fujiyama, uh, when that tidal wave came in, there's danger with all these nuclear power plants, uh, many of them by, uh, by ocean or rivers. And I, you know, luck plays a good part in a lot of this work. So I'm in the air. To my right, I would, I would generally fly in single engine Cessnas and I'd always sit in the back seat so I could shoot out both windows. Don't open the window, you can't open those windows. People say, well, isn't that a problem? No, it isn't. You just got to get your lens as close to the uh, window as possible to avoid reflections. That's more of a problem. Even if the uh, window is a little scratched or dirty, it doesn't have any that big an effect, really, because you can always sharpen things in Photoshop. And I'm exaggerating a little bit. I really didn't have to sharpen anything much at all. It was very rare that I had an issue with that. So anyway, I'm looking at the left side. That way I can shoot at both sides of the plane. So the right side was all clear sky. Left side had these beautiful skies. But now what made the shot was I was so lucky that that ship was below me at the very instant that I fly by. You take that ship out of there, it's nowhere near as good a photograph. So you, you do need some luck. Now, of course, today you could say, well, Photoshop, you could put one in there, but that's cheating. I would, I would never do that. Here's the Outer Banks off North Carolina. Here again, I think the highest point on the Outer Banks, and that's generous right in the middle, is about six feet above sea level. 
So you can see that's got nowhere to run when, when storm surges come in there. I like getting clouds too. You'll notice I always like to have clouds. I, the, for me as a photographer, the worst thing is a clear sky. I do not like clear blue skies. I always like to see clouds and the interest of clouds, plus the fact that there's water in the clouds. We're getting much more evaporation, much more cloud cover today than we were, say, 40 years ago. So I like to show that. And then here's Miami. And to show you the stupidity that uh, people have, probably as some of you are aware of this, that they're still building condominiums in downtown Miami in parking lots where the water bubbles up at high tides, or not even during high tide, anymore. the water just bubbles up because Miami Miami's built on porous limestone. Um, so let me just, let's see, we have a couple of questions. Let me see. Fukushima, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, You know, whoop, why did I freeze? No pun intended. What? Oh, okay, that's right. Okay, <clears throat> so then the, the third book I did, so I did the East Coast and the West Coast. I've been told I'm the only photographer in history <laughs> that has put the two coasts together you know, one in one book, a second in the other book. And then the, the only photographer then to do three books, that's why it was called a trilogy of North American waters. So after the East Coast and West Coast, I thought, boy, it'd be great to do the Mississippi River. And why? Because basically the Mississippi River is the depository of, of the ocean of fresh water that falls in the middle of the country. It's the second largest watershed uh, in, uh, in North America. And so you can see all these tributaries, of course, the Missouri River goes in, the Ohio River, the Tennessee, the Arkansas River, it's just on and on and on. <laughs> and then the Mississippi River was a chance to go beyond commenting on the environment which was something I liked as well. Here's the source of the Mississippi. Starts, uh, you can read that plaque they have there carved into wood here, 1,475 feet above the ocean. The mighty Mississippi begins to flow on its winding way, 2,552 miles to the Gulf of Mexico. Take uh, For the water that starts there and makes it all the way down, it takes about 90 days. And you can walk, we can, you can actually, it's very shallow there. I went out there with a, uh, a uh, I forget the name of the camera that you can, it's waterproof camera that I could put in the water. I didn't use the, the shots though. Here's the only time I got myself in a photograph in any of my books, kind of like Alfred Hitchcock used to get himself in all his films. So I just did one little, me and my shadow to give some scale. So this is the Mississippi River. This is about, oh, maybe five miles from the first shot. And you can see it's not, it's really not even a river. It's a, it's basically a 20 foot wide stream that you could jump across. And here it is. I wanted to be there in winter. All my books, I start in winter because of the ice. And, uh, Diane, I don't know if you're aware of this place in Minnesota, the National Eagle Center in, in uh, Wabasha. Yeah, this was great. And I made arrangements when we were there. I didn't know what to expect. And then I saw a, a presentation with these eagles. And this, is, this eagle is named Angel. And then I made arrangements with them to go back in the winter to get this photograph and took them out to the river and he was injured, uh, a wing was broken. Uh, he was brought back to health and the wing was fixed, but he cannot fly. So he's a permanent resident there. And this gentleman whose name is Al Cooper has been taking care of him for 20 years now. 
course, the Mississippi is known for the barge traffic. This is taken with a drone. So I was doing a lot of uh, flying still, getting up in the air with a, in airplanes. But I also learned how to fly a drone because I knew there'd be areas where a plane wouldn't be uh, possible because planes can't go below 400 feet and drones can't go above 400 feet. Excuse me, this was taken at about 300 feet. And this is uh, Bellevue, Iowa. And this was, again, luck. So the drone goes up. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to get. And lo and behold, I have a barge going through the lock, breaking in two, and then another barge right behind it. Of course, the Mississippi is known for flooding. The, uh, it's been flooding forever. Uh, but now, uh, and I'm not going to get into all the details about floodplains and all that. It's very interesting, though. But here you can see uh, uh, the. This is in Carothersville in uh, uh, Missouri, and uh, you can see the historic water river stage water level on in 2011 got up to that height, which would take it right down the street. And if it wasn't for these floodgates, which they closed. And here you can see a floodgate in, opera in operation. This is in uh, 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 Cape Girardeau on the river. And you can see the, flood, the, the floodgate on the left photograph in the middle, just behind the clock. So that's closed. I'm looking down Main Street. And then the image on the right was taken the next day in a helicopter. I did fly in a helicopter once. Uh, and I'm looking back, there's the floodgate that we just see on the left that's closed and you can see the water right up against it. And this was, it's, it's getting this close. It wasn't a flood uh, time of year or anything, but it's becoming more normal uh, almost every day that these floodgates have to get closed in times when you don't expect they would be. Here's a levee that broke uh, way back in uh, 2016. And the Army Corps of Engineers did a cost uh, benefit analysis and decided to leave it as is. Can you imagine? Much to the dismay of the farmers who live in the area. So the farmers, when, it, when the river gets to flood stage, is just receding a little bit here. Sometimes they try to make their own levees. And the government keeps paying them for losses. They think that's cheaper than fixing the levy. And my understanding is they're going to fix it one of these days. Uh, here, uh, the, of course, uh, American history is in the river. That's the other thing I liked about it. It's not just the environmental problems of flooding and all the agriculture. There's a lot of fertilizer and pesticide gets dumped in the river and ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but this, uh, where the Missouri, and uh, which is in the top center, and then the Mississippi River is down below it in the foreground and makes that sharp right turn. You can see that point out there. I was out there and got stuck in the mud, so to speak, which was quite an experience. Uh, but right across from that point, you'll see a little, a few trees over in the left side here. And that's where Lewis and Clark camped for several months, getting ready to go on their trip uh, across the uh, Mississippi and up the Missouri River. Here we're in the pilot house of one of the barges. That, if you look out there, that's as, as long as the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. So there's only 14 uh, men and women uh that are that run the bar that run the tow boat they're called even though they don't tow they push um uh, 14 person crew uh, seven on at a time seven during the day seven at night hard work but pays really well uh memphis uh where we are now is the lorraine hotel again american history all along the river uh this is where martin luther king was assassinated and that wreath at the Lorraine Hotel. It's now a, uh, a civil rights museum that's over on the left. And the wreath marks the place where he was shot. 
and the two cars were there, the Cadillac, and I can't see what the other one is. Vicksburg, Mississippi, where a big, great Civil War battle took place. And of course, this is a replica of one of these steamships. It's the uh, largest replica made. It's, it's a monster. And it's the train station is there as well. Indian culture is all up and down the river. And of course, there's the uh, Trail of Tears, which was set up by Andrew Jackson. All 1839, all Native Americans were told to get out of the uh, east of the Mississippi because uh, government wanted all the land for farming. And so they kicked them all out and a lot of disease, a lot of death. Uh, there were a lot of mound societies they are called M-O-U-N-D. You can see a mound right behind that man in the middle of the shot there, and they were used for ceremonial purposes in some cultures, burial purposes in other cultures. And every year they go, they have a festival here at this Winterville Mounds, uh, which is uh, in on the Mississippi Delta. Cotton, of course, uh, once you get south, uh, once you get just actually just north of Memphis. You can see the crops change as you go down. Uh, you get cotton uh, just uh, from Memphis pretty well down to uh, Louisiana when sugar takes over. These are columns remaining from uh, um, a uh, mansion uh, that was built uh, just before the Civil War broke out. And uh, after it survived the war, it had been occupied by both the Union and Confederate troops. Uh, there was a party after the war, and someone lit a match in the wrong place, and it burned to the ground. And only the columns remained, and they've kept them there. And uh, it's a freaky place. <laughs> this was shot with a drone, by the way. The great, see, the great thing about a drone is like bringing a ladder with you. So the drone's up about 30 feet in the air. So it's, it solves a lot of uh, different problems. Now, this is taken on an airplane, Exxon Mobil uh, uh, re oil refinery in Baton Rouge. From, from Baton Rouge all the way down to the Gulf, they call it the chemical coast, or some people call it the cancer coast. It's just industry, oil refineries all the way down. And again, well, a lot of this ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. These are the only slave cabins left uh, that are the actual slave cabins uh, from uh, before the Civil War. And this beautiful alley of oak trees that you see uh, and the trees were planted at the same time. So the trees are actually witness to the slave uh, conditions at that time. Very moving. And that, it's the only plantation uh, in, in the South that has the original slave cabins. And this is where the river ends. This is the mouth of the river and going into the Gulf of Mexico. And I talked about fertilizer runoff and things of that nature and uh, pesticide runoff. And when the, when the water gets into the Gulf, or yeah, when the river uh, water gets into the Gulf of Mexico, there's a dead zone the size of Rhode Island, or maybe even bigger, where no, <clears throat> nothing can grow in it. No fish can swim in it. No plants can grow in it. It's just no oxygen whatsoever. And that's because of all that runoff that ends up in the river. Also, this whole area where you're looking at the wetlands of Louisiana, the coast, it's, it's disappearing at a football field every hour, is the estimate. Uh, it's not, it doesn't look like this, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it didn't live much more land there and it's disappearing very rapidly. And why is that bad? Because that was a buffer for storm surges. The wetlands stopped the storm surges from coming up. So now the water goes right up the river, right up the canals that were made by humans to allow shipping and it just flows right in to the river. And after Hurricane Katrina, they built a lot of uh, barriers to prevent that. All right, so this gives leads us to Iceland. 
Iceland's an interesting story because uh, I photographed this two years ago. I got home almost two years ago to the day. Uh, my wife and I had always wanted to go. I had no intention of doing a book. I had all we wanted to do was go visit. We booked a uh, group tour. There were 16 of us uh, all around from all over the world. It was a great group of people in a Mercedes van. <laughs> it's got to go in style, right? And uh, we, we were supposed to go. Uh, counterclockwise if you if any, i guess many of you have been to iceland we were originally going to go counterclockwise around the island but it was winter we were getting a lot of snow and ice and had to make a lot of adjustments so we ended up going clockwise with a few deviations now the fascinating thing which you can see with this cover and then let me go to the these are the end papers so the end papers, I don't know if you got your thumbnail, if you can see me in the thumbnail, here's the book. And so the end papers are this part of the book. And it's on the front and back covers. So that's ice from the, the Blue Lagoon. Now, what fascinated when I so we're driving around and I had my cameras with me, of course, I thought I'd get some nice landscape shots, but still, I, I had no idea I was going to do a book. And we're driving. Most, uh, half of these shots were taken from inside the van through the window. And a lot of that, I felt so easy because I'd done so much aerial photography, shooting out of a window looking ahead to what's coming and that prepared me so what's what's the difference instead of being in an airplane i'm in an automobile or in a van with a huge window so a lot of these this was taken through the window I don't, and we're going you know 20 30 miles an hour depending on the road conditions sometimes 50. and what what started to fascinate me and i, I started seeing this within the first day and then really hitting home the second day there was a cinematographer once said there's nothing like black and white subject matter photographed in color or on color film so in other words using color film to photograph something that's mainly black and white and gray and i started to see this i'm going wow that's that's really something and then these bits of color would pop out every so often so here's a great example. This is a completely black and white and gray. This is the way it looked, shot in color, but you can just see a little bit of color in the grass that's popping through the snow. So this, this hook started to get me. This is the uh, Gota Foss, which is, if you've been there, it's spectacular in winter. I've, I've seen shots during this, warmer months and it's i just felt winter is the time to be there it's just incredible so it, it freezes up and now you have this black and white and gray and then this bit of color that just pops out you have color popping out of neutrals which i love that so by the second third day i'm thinking you know i think i got a maybe i didn't still didn't think about a book but i thought oh, yeah, i'm getting a pretty good body of work here this is in a town called Vic, V-I-K, which is uh, near the well near this area, where those sea stacks are on the, near the the Black Sand Beach. Now, I'm out of the car here. Not everything. I was out of the car for this and this. Say about half of them I was driving. The other half I was outside. This was taken from in in the vehicle though, traveling along. So I can see this coming up just like I would and you get used to it because like, I was in an airplane. And again, so there's just this tiny bit of green. Here we had a tiny bit of red popping out of it, tiny bit of green. Uh, here's the Diamond Beach. And that's a, practically everyone who goes to Iceland, if not, well, probably everyone who goes to Iceland wants to get to this beach. And a nice gray day, I just loved it. And uh, 
So this blue just really pops out. And here's a spread. I did a couple of spreads from the book just to show you how the book's laid out. And that's a, from, on the right side is Diamond Beach again with a wave crashing over. And on the left is along the highway on the eastern shore of, uh, of Iceland as we're, we're making the turn in toward the Blue Lagoon. It's, it's maybe, I don't know, 50 miles from the Blue Lagoon. And here's the here. This is the Blue Lagoon. So great ice shapes of ice here, and it's just incredible. And this is the uh, Thingvellir National Park. <clears throat> if anybody's been there, this is where. You know, uh, so now we hearken back to the Aleutian Islands with the tectonic plates. So here you can walk in between two tectonic plates that are moving apart you don't have to worry you're going to get crushed you'd have to they're moving apart so uh, that's the north american plate is on the left and the eurasian plate is on the right and iceland the glaciers i i say that ice why ice why iceland well what's the connection to climate change well because everybody knows it's melting uh, the Greenland ice caps melting, Antarctica is melting, all the glaciers around the world are melting. In Glacier National Park in Montana, they're disappearing very rapidly. So ice has become a symbol of climate change. Again, moving in a car here. In the car. Again, the gray, the black and white and gray. Uh, the shot from the left is at a town called uh, Jupivogur. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And on the right is the highest point in Iceland, Havanas, wait, Havanadasnipur. These are just two uh, mole hills basically covered with ice. This is taken from the vehicle moving along. At a pretty good clip. And I just, you get that little corner of blue sky up there. This is the Stogafoss, which is a very high uh, waterfall. Um, here, see the people look like matchsticks. Uh, and again, black, white, gray, and the color of the jackets coming through. Street signs. It looked like a dead end. I guess it was. The snow, there was no, we had to turn around here. Couldn't get through. So we got, it, got out of the, the vehicle and was able to get some shots. Uh, these are geothermal pipe. You know, the, ironically, the Icelanders are not creating to global warming whatsoever because all their energy is produced through geothermal uh, for the most part. And these are geothermal pipes. This is near, near Reykjavik to just south, maybe 50 miles south uh, east. And I'm in, we're in the vehicle here. And that they go right across the road, right under the road. And we're coming up. I didn't know what they were until I had to look them up afterwards, see what they were. Power lines crisscrossing the, the island, the blue coming out of this lake. Again, black, white, gray, touch of blue, touch of red. This came up really quickly. Sometimes you have to react so quickly in the vehicle. And it's amazing. 90% of the time you react quickly, you get the shot. It's incredible. How the human brain can sometimes anticipate so quickly. Uh, this was a canyon that we was not on our um, trail, but we were having so much trouble, and the, our guide uh, decided to take us to this place that she really loved to visit. And it's called the Gologlifur Canyon. It's off uh, Route One near Hamstag.
Blue Lagoon, of course. And we end here on the Black Sand Beach with the waves crashing in. And that's it. So let me see. So if anyone has some questions, go, I don't see any, but if anyone has any, please let me know or type them in. Right. Otherwise I'm gonna go get a martini. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, um, if you can stop sharing your screen, that would be, that would be marvelous. Yes. Right. Um, what a powerful set of images you have. Thank They're you. just, just beautiful. Um, I do have one question. Um, well, one person has asked, how long was your trip to Iceland? About eight days. Yep. You covered, days. covered a lot just, of ground. We left just, um, you know, everyone knew COVID was coming and no one quite, not everyone knew, knew, knew how bad it was going to be. Chinese knew and some epidemiologists knew. And we left out of JFK, even though I live in Philly, we left out of JFK and, uh, I don't know, maybe a handful of people were wearing masks. And when we got back, I was on my, my spring break at Temple University and uh, got back and things were getting pretty bad. The university was going to go to Zoom classes. I had to, it's the first time I had my encounter with Zoom. And uh, the very next week, they stopped, everyone went home. So we just got that. That's the last time we traveled of any great, to any great extent. All right. Now, you your first uh, three photo or th first three photo books are really um, all in black and white. And uh, um, right. would you consider going back and and doing those in color, or um, oh, no. what was your thought process of using the black and white? Well, if you look closely, they're not really black and white. They're what's called, uh, they're, mo they're all monochromatic, but they're all toned. They're all different tones. So some are sepia, some are uh, have more gray in them, some have, are a little cooler than others. So they're all different tonalities. And the reason for that, I was greatly influenced by the photographers that documented the American West back in the 1870s, 1880s, and you know those were the real pioneers. I mean, now I'm flying around shooting from the air. Those poor uh, pioneers with with these huge bellows cameras and rickety wagons <laughs> didn't know where they were going. What was next around the bend? They would have been so envious of how easy it is now because you can drive almost you can drive the whole Pacific Coast for heaven's sake. And then you get up in the air and photograph. But they would love, I mean, they'd, they would do it in a heartbeat. So anyway, that was an influence. They had a lot of different tones there. And there are other photographers in the history of photography at the turn of the century, there was a group of photographers called the pictorialists. And there were a lot of different tones being used. And then some photographers were doing with it that are more contemporary, not a, only a handful. And I like that because I, it was a way to maintain interest, a way to, you know, like musicians use, musicians will often talk in terms of color and tonal in, in their music and their playing, that's a metaphorical colors. And for me, the, the, whether it's a cool tone or a warm tone, I would, I would use that to express the way I felt. I try to remember my feeling at the time I took the photograph. So the tone is kind of representative of that. People always ask me, well, how do you know what tone to use? That's the best answer I can give. It's just, it's a feeling. It's a feeling. So that's the reason. And then Iceland, I knew I wanted to use color, but ironically, it still became monochromatic, even though it was shot in color, because it's all black and white and gray, and then you have color popping out of it. So it became a coda. That's why I say it's a coda. The, the th first three books are hardcover, big. The Iceland book is soft cover. It's more intimate, uh, and but it's it was it, it became a perfect coda. It's color, but still very monochromatic, and I like that that aspect. 
Do you use a filter for your for your monochrome Im images? Uh, no, the, the toning is all done in Photoshop. So if I when I shoot that, uh, for example, West Coast, or any of those images, they're shot in color and with a digital camera. And I get them into Photoshop and I convert them to black and white. And then I add the toning in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty, that, that's the, the way that it gets done. All right. Your, your book, um, Iceland Wintertide, is in both Icelandic and English. Yes. With the Icelandic uh, provided by Oyder Ava uh, Olaf's daughter. Right. Um, and how did you how did you meet her and uh, get her interested in this? All right. So let me go back to the other first. The other three books I've always had writers. Uh, Simon Winchester, for those of you who know him, he's a pretty well known uh, writer of nonfiction. He's done all kinds of uh, a lot of geology books, but maybe half of them. But uh, probably his most famous book is The Professor and the Madman which was about the creation of the Oxford English Dictionary. It's a fascinating tale, actually. So I wanted him, I got him to write, that's another story. But for every one of those books that he did the main text, I got a female writer to do the forewords or the afterwords. And I wanted to continue that. And so this, was the, we didn't have a lot of room in this, but we wanted to keep it small. So I just wrote a page, an artist statement, so to speak. And then I wanted to have an Icelander write an afterward. So a good friend of mine knows a, uh, has a good friend who is, uh, has a gift store in Reykjavik. And apparently everybody knows everybody in Reykjavik, or if they don't, they can find them. So first I did some research. I said, well, I'd like an Icelandic author. So I look, I went on the internet, I got a lot of names and she was very appealing to me, uh, just reading about her. She's an art historian among other things. So, and she also ran the, uh, uh, the art museum at the University of uh, Iceland briefly. She's a professor, uh, teaches art history and then she's this great novelist, poet and playwright. So I bought a couple of her books and read them and I, I liked what she had to say. I liked her stuff. So I got in touch with this friend. I said, can you find this woman's email? I can't find it anywhere. So he did. And I wrote her uh, an email and she said, yes. I said, I just want to, you know, I think she wrote 800 words, which is all we wanted. And I thought she was very eloquent. I loved the way she talked about her girlhood in the book and, the memories she had as a young girl growing up in Iceland. And so she just tied everything together really, really well. And she's really, you know, we're, we still stay in touch. <clears throat> she's just a really nice woman. <clears throat> so I've never had anyone, every author I've ever asked to write has, has said yes. And so I always tell people, if, the, if you have someone you want to write for you, find out the best way to get in touch with them. If you can find it, it's always best if you can find a direct email, <clears throat> excuse me. And I said, though, what's the worst they can say? No, it's the worst that can happen. But if you don't try, and if you, if you explain it really, I, I take a lot of care in the letters I write. I just don't write it, run something off quick. I'll write a really carefully worded letter. I leave them a lot of outs. <clears throat> You know, if you would consider this, if you have time, you know, all that kind of if. And uh, they've always said yes. All right. Well, well, we're just about out of time, but I do want to just uh, uh, read something that uh, Susan Atwood, one of our attendees, has written. Uh, okay. It says, such awesome photography. I have been to Iceland during the winter months. It is so beautiful. Thank you for your beautiful photos. I'm so sad to see the ice melting. I loved your color photos. They were mostly black and white, but the color that pops on the barns, the colorful jackets, etc. Thank you very much for this presentation. I enjoyed the photos from your first three books as well. And I'd like to add that I have never seen so many different whites. Um, the you know the the um, subtlety of those 
uh, Icelandic photographs are just uh, are just incredible. Okay. So what are what are some of your future projects? Uh, well, I'm I'm staying put for a while, and I'll if you have a few minutes, it'll take me about a, three or four minutes to explain it, but it might be worth it. So I'm done with landscapes and climate change because nobody listens anyway. <laughs> getting getting very depressed about that. You know, a, a report came out just last week or two weeks ago, another major report saying we're screwed. Pardon my French. And and then another group of climate scientists said, you know, we're not even going to put the reports out anymore. We keep putting them out. Everyone goes, oh my God, are we in trouble? And then nobody does anything. So it's there, and we're past the tipping point anyway. So we could stop putting everything out tomorrow and it's too late. That's now you're hearing the cynic in me, but it's true. I can't can't hide it. <laughs> so I don't want to do that anymore. So we just moved in September from a house we'd been in for 45 years. And I had in storage uh, a 29 volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica from 1911. And I thought, well, what do I want to do with them? I knew I had them and I'd done some research before. And I thought, well, let me look at them again. Do I want to keep them? Now they're not worth anything as a, even if they were in pristine condition, they're not worth anything financially but they're worth their weight in gold from a scholarly standpoint in a certain period of time, which is 1911. And the, they've written by some of the best writers at the time, mainly, uh, mainly English and American. It's an Encyclopedia Britannica, of course, it's an English uh, edition. And in 1911, the Americans started to help with, with uh, design and publishing and and distribution in fact the dedication is to the queen the king of england and the president of the united states at the time so i thought and then so it's 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 filled with optimism and the extent of human knowledge at that time is extraordinary in 1911 i mean it's we're on the cusp of so many things so much that is understood, some that just starting to understand, but it's also sprinkled with racism. I mean, out and out racism, because it's, you know, it's still a white person's point of view in 1911. So I started reading some of the entries and I thought, gee, I, I gotta do something with this. So I ended up, I, I've only done, I've done six images so far. I wanted, I did start to do collages in Photoshop. And I used the encyclopedia, uh, for example, I did evolution was one of the topics. I wanted to see what did they say about evolution back in 1911, because the origin of the species had been out since the 1850s. And it's just how they, how they describe it. They go into the philosophy of it from the Greeks to the English and French philosophers talking about evolution. And then, of course, into the creation aspect of it and then they start talking about darwin and then they go back to it's a huge article probably it'd be 40 page book you know and it's the, the history of the united states in there is it would be about a 500 page book if it's if it were in today's print so i i, I use that as a background with how they felt about evolution and then in the then i overlay it with color images that I research on the internet that show, that contrast it to the past. So I get past, present. And I've, it's been a lot of fun. They're very time consuming because I got to do a lot. I got to decide what, what part of an article do I want to photo highlight. And I take the pages into Photoshop. I turn them, I twist them. I, because you can do, I just photograph them straight, but then Photoshop, you can manipulate them and twist them. And then I just start overlaying. And uh, so that's what I'm going to be doing for a while. And I don't have to leave my house, don't have to pay any gas, I don't have to go through an airport. <laughs> I think I might be doing it at just the right time. <laughs> Sounds like sounds like you've uh, you've paced that out pretty well. Yeah. Um, but again, David, thank you so much for this evening. Um, it's it's been a pleasure to have you.
And uh, before we end our program, I just want to update um, people on a couple of upcoming events. Okay. On Wednesday, March 24th, so just 10 days from now, at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, our business member, uh, travel agency Hey Iceland, will participate in a webinar to update us on the travel outlook for 2022 and uh, some opportunities for us to utilize their services. Um, hey Iceland is offering a 20% discount on self-drive tours that uh, you book by April 30th. Uh, and you can uh, get more information from the recent blog that was posted on the INL US website, um, including the discount code to be used when you're booking your, tour, your trip. And then on Wednesday, April 14th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, INL US will host an author's corner with William R. Short of the Hurstwick Institute and Rainer Oskerson on their book, Men of Terror. And this presentation will focus on cultures, values, and the etiquette of Viking combat. I'd also like to mention that uh, the INL US's Basic One uh, Icelandic language class will begin on March 31st. So if you're interested in, in starting to learn Iceland, Icelandic, this is for you. Uh, if you would like to participate, you may enroll through the INL US website. Just go to the Icelandic language page under the travel and culture tab. So David, again, thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. Good night. And Doug, thank you. My pleasure, enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Okay, have a good night.